On this week in enterprise tech, COVID-19 is reaching all ends of the earth. In fact, it's actually affecting hardware as well. There's some shortages there. Brian's going to take us through what's going on. Plus, Curtis Bryan and I talk with a great guest, Shauna Wolverton, Senior Vice President of Product at Zendesk. She talks about CRM and how platforms are allowing businesses to actually scale out and customize to fit their ever-changing needs. Don't want to miss it. It's quiet on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 384, recorded March 13th, 2020, the Zen of CRM. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy for three extra months free with a one-year package. Go to expressvpn.com slash enterprise. And by Melissa. Bad data happens to good companies. That's why 10,000 businesses count on Melissa for clean, reliable address data. Get started today with 25,000 records clean for free. That's a $75 value at melissa.com slash twit. And by PlexTrack. PlexTrack has finally solved the pain of security assessment reporting. Try PlexTrack free for one month, either on-prem or in the cloud with no contracts or risks. Go to plextrack.com slash twit to claim your free month today. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guy through this big, giant world of the enterprise. But I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own Mr. Geek in Paradise, Mr. Brian Chi, director of the Ensign Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. But Chibert, there's some changes coming soon to that title. Is that right? Yes, indeed. I am actually going to be transferring the intellectual property for the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory to Leeward Community College and a bunch of my old, my ex-students. And uh, if all goes well, they'll even have my Class C address space, my Slash 60 IPv6 address space, the DNS entries, and my uh, Google domain, which ought to be a lot of fun. In fact, I'm hoping I can also transfer my Microsoft domain. So hopefully things will keep going. Heck, Advanced Network Computing Laboratory is even trademarked. Woo. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, speaking of experience and experts, we have our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, how are things down there in the Sunshine State? Well, we are in the midst of the sort of mild to severe panic that's gripping the rest of the mainland. But aside from that, uh, it's warm, sunny, and uh, just another day in the Sunshine State. What can I say? We're happy to be here on Twyatt, enjoying talking about enterprise technology and all the things that happen in the scary, scary world of computer security. Well, you know, I'm going to try to stay positive in today's climate, which means I'm going to be celebrating Pi Day tomorrow instead of celebrating Friday the 13th today. Are you guys doing anything special for Pi Day? Eh, not no. really. No, no pie. Well, all right. The, well, that's all right. The big thing that I like to do is go down to the local tattoo parlors where several of them have uh, specials. They give cheap tattoos on Friday the 13th, and people start lining up 12 to 18 hours ahead of time. So it's always exciting to see the kind of people that line up waiting for cheap tattoos and just imagining what sort of art is going to result. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, unfortunately, like we've all said, COVID-19 is reaching the ends of the earth and it's having effects on lots of things, including hardware shortages. And Chibert's going to take us through what's going on there this today. In fact, COVID-19 is affecting us all. In fact, it's driving a lot of us to be remote workers as well. 
But is your security team ready for that? We're going to discuss that and look out what's what, what actually you can look out for there. Plus, we have a great guest, Shauna Wolverton. She's the SVP of product at Zendesk over there. And she's gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about CRM, open source, open APIs, and how your organization can bring more value by customizing your experience and being the bringing the power of CRM to your organization. But first, this week we had a lot of news, and a lot of it might be centered around COVID-19. But let's get to it, this week's blips. Now, it's happened many times in history that in time of crisis, the bad guys will take advantage of it. Now, with COVID-19 in full spring, so are the cyber criminals. In fact, security experts are saying there's been a spike in email scams linked to coronavirus, and it's the worst and they've actually seen in many near years. Now, cyber criminals are targeting individuals as well as industries, including aerospace, transport, manufacturing, hospitality, healthcare, and even insurance. That's right. Phishing emails are written in English, French, Italian, Japanese, and Turkish languages, and they've been found in the wild. Some examples of this are actually a quote-unquote click here for a cure, a mysterious doctor's claiming to have details about a vaccine being covered up by the Chinese and UK governments. I love the conspiracy theorists targeting a specific demographic, don't you? Now, another example is the COVID-19 tax refund email. Who wouldn't want some money back from the government, especially when they could or have contracted the pandemic? Now, there has also been some examples of false emails coming from the World Health Organization claiming that an attached document details how recipients can actually prevent disease spread. What has also been seen in some of the messages are actually targeting people's fears, like saying COVID-19 is now airborne. That's right. It's designed to look like it's from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. It uses one of the organization's legitimate email addresses, but has in fact been sent via a spoofing tool. Now, this goes to show you that you and your organization must be vigilant, especially in time of crisis, and ensure that information comes from valid and trusted sources and not from a medium that could be misdirected and infected. Now, this is a, definitely an example of when you need to train your users on what to look for and how to react. Gender equality in cyberspace could drive a huge economic boost. According to ISC Squared, the global security workforce is going to have to grow by 145% to meet demand. If it doesn't, more than 4 million jobs will be left unfilled. A new study finds that closing the gender and skills gaps could boost the U.S. and U.K. economies by $30.4 billion and 12.6 billion pounds, respectively. If both gaps were minimized and the number of women in cybersecurity equal the number of men, the total contribution of the cybersecurity industry to the overall economy could grow to reach $138.1 billion in the U.S., and 41.3 billion pounds in the UK. Now, two thirds of the women surveyed agree that there is a gender gap in cybersecurity, but that's not the only challenge they face. Other hurdles include lack of industry awareness, as reported by 43% of women on average, as well as a lack of clear career paths, lack of requisite skills, and the all important lack of role models. Well, here's a interesting story. We've had Tim Titus of uh, Past Solutions on the show several times. And he and I were actually talking last night, trying to figure out how to do this story without making it sound like an ad. So anyway, here, let's give it a shot. <clears throat> In a move to help embattled IT workers deal with the huge work surge from this unprecedented work at home uh, movement, our friends at Pass Solutions are offering their network troubleshooting tool at this URL. Think of it as a free network test tool that you can give to your remote workers that can give you concrete network performance numbers instead of thus them just telling you they had a junk connection. While this may sound like an advertisement, Pass Solutions really does want to give IT support teams some tools without requiring you to fork over a credit card. Tim, thanks very much. The COVID-19 pandemic is unprecedented. And the reality is we need an unprecedented level of cooperation to survive this storm. 
Now, Comcast has been in the news lately on multiple fronts, including Internet service increase due to people staying at home all around the country and the world. However, what has piled on the naughty pile is their leak of 200,000 unlisted phone numbers. That's right. Comcast mistakenly published the names, phone numbers and addresses of nearly 200,000 customers who paid monthly fees to make their numbers unlisted or private. Now, the names and numbers were made available on an equal listing, a directory run by Comcast and picked up by a third party directory. Now, after discovering the mistake, Comcast shut down equal listing, gave $100 credit to effective customers and advised them that they can change their phone numbers at no charge. Now, this is similar to a mistake in the early 2010 when they resulted in Comcast paying out $33 million settlement back in uh, back in 2015. Now, Comcast had people paying to stay private. In fact, they charged $3.50 a month for the number privacy feature in Pennsylvania. Now, the Philadelphia Inquirer actually wrote about this. Now, the customers elsewhere apparently paid more. Some Comcast users on support on a support form reported having paid $5.50 per month. Now, a statement from Comcast said, we are correcting this issue for our identified customers, apologize to them for this error and given them an additional $100 credit. We're working with the customers to directly address this issue and help make it right. Now, however, customers are not easily fooled by getting dollars thrown at them here. They actually feel that their safety is now compromised and cannot, and it can actually not be reversed. Who knows? Comcast just might have another bug or big suite coming to counterbalance that another big mistake. Turla, a Russian-based APT group, is finding out what happens when your enemies can easily trace your activity and your infrastructure. The activities of Turla Group, which is a stealthy Russia-based threat actor associated with numerous attacks on government, Diplomatic, technology, and research organizations may be trackable because the group's penchant to use older malware and techniques alongside its arsenal of newer custom tools. Researchers at Recorded Future recently came to that conclusion after conducting an in-depth analysis of Turla's activities using data from its threat intelligence platform and several other sources, including open source intelligence. Recorded Futures analysis showed Turla, which is also known as Snake and Venomous Bear, to be a group that is continuing to develop its own advanced custom malware tools and adopting new attack and obfuscation methods all the time. As a matter of fact, in 2019, the group began ramping up its use of PowerShell scripts via Powersploit and PowerShell Empire. It also developed a custom PowerShell backdoor dubbed Power Stallion, all in an apparent effort to make discovery harder for defenders. And at least twice in the past, Turla has also leveraged malware and infrastructure belonging to other threat groups to carry out its own missions. First time in 2012, when Turla members reused malware belonging to a China best threat actor called Quarian. Recorded Future found that while Turla frequently targets Windows systems, they've also deliberately targeted email servers using custom backdoors for Microsoft Exchange and other mail servers in order to take control of email traffic. This group has also been using compromised WordPress sites for command and control purposes and WordPress-focused URLs for delivering payloads. I guess that reusing old intellectual property is just a hard habit to break. Students are getting eviction notices. Chaos ensues after colleges tell students to stay away. In a side effect of colleges canceling classes to avoid the spread of this pandemic, students are suffering the side effects of being told to go home. Students from low-income families are wondering if they can even afford to come back to school, with many students wondering if their financial aid will be extended. The University of Hawaii is being told to prepare to shift to distance learning model with some departments quietly changing their plans for large scale lecture hall classes. I just recently, in fact, yesterday afternoon, got this notice from the University of Hawaii President's Office. Everyone should postpone or cancel travel to high risk, aka level three countries, as designated by the CDC and considering the same for areas with active community transmission including within the United States. Those with underlying health conditions should consider postponing or canceling any travel. We also just got a notice yesterday that we will not be holding in-person classes after spring break until this outbreak is under control. 
the reality is this is going to be the case for o- almost every university across the nation. Why is this enterprise? Well, universities are big buyers of technology, and this move is pretty much pressing the pause button on purchases in the academic market. I'm also fairly sure similar moves are happening in a lot of other industries. Hang tight, folks. That's right. Well, if you work or learn remotely, you know there are some tools that you need to make it simpler to stay in touch and informed. And some of those tools provide a way way to communicate in real time, including video and chat. And in the current climate, there's an increasing need to increase the social interactions, especially real-time ones, and improve the ability to collaborate without that barrier of being in person. In fact, as the number of infections and deaths from the novel coronavirus rise drastically, governments, schools, and companies around the world are instituting more drastic measures to rein in the virus's spread. And the moves are causing companies to accelerate an already growing trend of working from home, and that's playing out in their increased use of workplace software. Now, quarantines, cancellations, and work-from-home policies have greatly driven up the demand for video and chat software that allows people to try and maintain some resemblance of business as usual. Now, in in response, workplace software companies like Zoom, Microsoft, and Google have offered their software for free and have taken pains to make sure that they can accommodate the growing demand from users. Now, Microsoft Teams saw a 500% increase in meeting, meetings, calls, and conferences usage in China since the end of January, according to the spokesperson. Now, Zoom wouldn't comment specifically on the growth of, in the usership, but Zoom C- CFO did state they were seeing an increased amount of usage over the last several months. Now, Slack as well has not commented on their numbers, but the demand is definitely there for them as well. Now, Microsoft Microsoft has offered anyone its premium version of Teams for free for six month, months and has lifted existing user limits on its free version. Now, the premium Teams product was already available for no extra cost to those who pay for Microsoft Office Suite, and Teams already face be, has been free for many schools as well. So let's hope that services like these and other technologies can help normalize people's ability to work and learn remotely, as well as provide a bit of continuity and certainty in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty going on well folks that does it for the blips next up the bites but before we get to the bites we have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech and that's express vpn now we all know how express or how vpns protect your privacy and security online right well there are a lot of vpn providers out there and you've probably heard a few now some of you may even used a vpn before but i only recommend brands to our audience that i trust and i can say that express vpn is one of the best VPNs in the market. Now, if you're concerned about privacy and security, ExpressVPN doesn't log your data. Think about it. Many of the cheap free VPNs out there make money by selling your data to the to other companies. Now, ExpressVPN developed a technology called Trusted Server that actually makes it impossible for their servers to log any of your info. Now, speed is important to me when it comes to VPN, and many other VPNs are slow on your connection, on your down and up, and it makes your device even sluggish sometimes. Now, I've used ExpressVPN for some time, and my internet speeds are always blazing fast. Now, when I travel, I can tell you, I need to stay connected to video conferencing, and also I need my TV series fixes as well. Now, ExpressVPN unlocks this all for me, even when I'm connected to servers thousands of miles away. I can still stream HD quality videos with zero lag. That's right. Now, what really sets ExpressVPN apart from other VPNs is just really how easy it is to use. You just fire it up the app and you click on one button to connect and it's e- it's even easy for your parents and your grandparents out there. They can even use it. Plus, you can get it working right on your router as well. So you don't even have to click the button anymore. Don't take my only word for it. We have Tech Radar, The Verge, CNET, and many other tech experts rating ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. So protect yourself with the VPN that I use and trust. Use my link expressvpn.com slash enterprise today and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash enterprise. Visit expressvpn.com slash enterprise to learn more. And we thank ExpressVPN for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, we've heard COVID-19 is reaching all ends of the earth, right? Well, it's having effects on hardware shortages as well. And Chibert is going to go take us through all that. Chibert. Okay, so this story is borrowed from Ars Technica, 
And they're saying a couple of weeks ago, IPC, a trade group that represents electronic companies, surveyed manufacturers to estimate the impact of the coronavirus epidemic on the industry. Manufacturers surveyed said their suppliers have warned them that they should expect about three weeks of delays on average, but manufacturers expect things to get even worse than that, about five weeks on average, and select few have actually said expect delays longer than nine weeks. Well, some of the interesting things that have been happening is, like for instance here, I'm going to read some of the comments from the people that have been polled. My workplace had an order of Lenovo laptops for customers come in without the WLAN adapters installed. Lenovo has advised us that the lead time for the parts to come in is in the three to six month region. For the time being, they requested that we purchase off the shelf USB wireless dongles and they will reimburse them for the cost and install them for the customer until such time that they are able to provide the parts and installation services. So there's all kinds of things that are happening. And, you know, we can go on and on and on, but COVID-19 is really and truly unprecedented. We've never had something quite like this. We've never had a pandemic in modern history. You know, obviously we've had the plague and the Black Death and things like that. But for the first time, we've had the ability to be able to tell people, stay home. Well, staying at home is a double-edged sword. A lot of... A lot of work at home people, maybe they don't have enough equipment. Maybe they don't have a good firewall. Maybe they don't have this or that. So <clears throat> I'm going to say traditional companies, are they even ready to tell their people to work from home? We've, we've already heard comments from Kurt and Lou about part-time workers are getting, they're not getting a good shake on this one. So I'm going to ask Lou. You and Microsoft have all been asked to stay and work from home. What are some of the ramifications that have been happening? You already mentioned one, that you now have to get into the habit of scheduling break times because now everybody's doing, you know, my, in the, obviously Microsoft Teams meetings, one right after another after another. What other kinds of things are happening to you and what are the ramifications? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, when you're at when you're in a building in a, in a large company, a lot of times the conference rooms are held up uh, by other meetings, and so it's a natural way of separation where you can kind of sp separate or span out different meetings over time. So, for instance, if I want to do a meeting in an hour from now, the conference room is not available, so I have to schedule maybe another day. And so there's like this natural separation. It gives me kind of some time to actually focus on things. But now I'm, that I'm working from home, I'm literally sitting in this chair right here eight hours a day. Um, there's no need to get up and go to a conference room. And there's usually unlimited availability here because somebody can just make a, a Teams meeting, online meeting, whatnot. Uh, and I just have to go and, and, and join it because most of the time there's other people that have that time available too. So I'm actually finding that I'm not getting up very much. Uh, <laughs> and it's interesting. So I'm like you said, I'm having to schedule some break times in between. I'm having to have them push it out uh, so I can go out for a walk or or get some a snack or so on. So I'm actually seeing that as a unintended consequence of where I'm working remotely. But there's other things too, like for instance, um, a need for a very viable and strong and reliable connection. I mean, there are times where I'm having one-on-ones or even team meetings, and you know my connection is very kind of up and down. Now I have a business connection, um, and it's supposed to be fairly reliable, but. When the backbones and the different nodes in the area are overwhelmed, it doesn't matter if you have business or not, um, they're going to have trouble. So that's another thing that I'm actually seeing as an unintended consequence. Everyone working from home is putting a lot of stress on, on the network. Uh, and the last thing is hardware. Um, a lot of people – now, obviously, people from our company um, have the hardware to take home. And uh, in fact, Microsoft's been really great and gracious about, hey, what can you take home? And um, if we need to get you extra, that kind of thing. But some organizations, they don't have that luxury. Some education doesn't have that luxury. Um, and so working from home or learning from home is sometimes tougher because you just don't have the resources to be able to do it. And you don't want to go to a library or some other place to be able to get internet because then it just violates the whole thing of working from home. So I think there's a lot of interesting unintended consequences from having to stay at home because sometimes there are some barriers that you have to get over for sure. Cool. Hey, well, let's go ask Curtis. Your magazine is mostly folks working from home or working remotely. 
Has there been any change for you in the magazine area? Well, for our magazine, for Dark Reading, there's been no change at all because we are a completely virtual team. No, no one on the, virtu on the Dark Reading team uh, habitually goes into an office. We're all working from, from homes. And I'll be honest, I've been working from a home office with one uh, relatively brief two-year exception uh, since 1991. It's become a lot easier, but it is something that you know can be done. When it comes to things like internet access, you uh, come up with some alternatives. I, for example, uh, have a MiFi, uh, which is something that was uh, I, I saw the benefits of because of our very own Chebert. Uh, I also know where the coffee shops and other places with good, reliable internet connections are in my my area, and we also have a. Uh, fine public library here in Orlando that has a good solid connection. So there are, there are options that you learn. There are also things you do to stay productive and be a part of a team. Uh, Lou, I'm going to suggest that you try setting an alarm once an hour. Uh, get up. What's my alarm? I have to go refill this thing uh, to, to keep me well caffeinated uh, and the coffee machines on the other end of the house. So you learn small tricks. You become uh, more productive through the use of technology, but there really is a great deal of acculturation that has to take place. You know, in our case at Dark Reading, uh, we're used to, to gathering in virtual teams, ones, twos, up to the full team on a fairly regular basis. For the rest of my company, uh, the larger company, Informa, which is the world's largest event producer, uh, in many places, there are profound changes. There are some countries where working from a home office is practically unheard of. And there are some teams that just find it very difficult to do the sort of coordination they must do for a large event if they're not all in the same place. So it is a case-by-case, team-by-team thing. But most companies should be aware that if the work process will allow – the technology is, in fact, there to, to let people work from home and remain productive. Well, you know, speaking of specialized things, sometimes your corporation, either because it's personally identifiable information, you know, intellectual property, whatever, you really don't want that specialized information leaving and going into what could be a, a less well-secured network of a home office. So I've been a big, big fan of virtual desktop infrastructure. <laughs> and, um, you know, Lou is in a back channel talking about this thing he's got called a VDI jump box. Lou, tell us about it. Yeah, so the interesting thing is a lot of times remote desktop, um, you have to a specific gateway they connect to, and then you have to route through the gateway, and it's not as scalable as using a VDI-type technology. Uh, I think it's called Windows Virtual Desktop, um, and we can use a, a WVD uh, to actually use it as a jump box to then connect remotely to remote desktop services, and so then that doesn't make the uh, need for the gateway there. Uh, and the interesting thing is it uh, allows us to scale out a lot more, um, and the performance is, is actually fairly responsive. And so um, I'm seeing not only us, but a lot of organizations are using this type of technology um, to support that um, kind of scale-out feature. Now, you can scale out uh, RDP gateways as well. Um, it's definitely capable. Um, but this is a sometimes an interesting way to secure the channel as well um, because of you might have some normal channels that you have in the browser where you do, do MFA or different types of authentication and it's supported already through your browser. Uh, and so you want to support that for um, doing remote de desktop as well um, or remoting in. So this is a way to do that. And the interesting thing is a lot of organizations are starting to do that to ensure that they can scale out a lot faster. Um, and um, they they just don't have to worry about the security because it's already in place. Super cool. Well, you know what? I think one of the side effects of this whole pandemic is the IT industry is going to start coming up with some really clever ways of making the work at home movement work. 
anyway, um, you know what? Lou, take it back. You got it. Well, next up, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyer Riot, but we do have to thank another sponsor for this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Melissa. Now, what can really hurt a business? Well, bad data, of course. And, well, that's where the leader in address verification comes in. That's Melissa. Now, every address is covered from Adelaide, Australia to Zipakita, Colombia, and everywhere in between. Now, having run numerous businesses in the past and ones that depend on accurate data, I can tell you that there's nothing good about bad data. Nothing good. Not only does it cost you money, but it hurts your sales and decreases customer satisfaction, and it can really hurt the business. Now, if bad addresses, duplicate records, and bouncing emails are hurting your business, isn't it time to come clean with Melissa. Don't actually take my word for it, though. Check out Delta Fawcett, Z1 Motorsports, and car to go who use Melissa. In fact, Delta Fawcett was able to improve their call center processes with global address auto-completion. Melissa was actually able to reduce the fraudulent e-commerce transactions for Z1 Motorsports by 90%. Now, Melissa provides a full spectrum of data quality protection for your customer data. Now, they verify postal addresses, mobile numbers, and email addresses. And then they update the addresses of customers that have moved and actually eliminate duplicate records. Now, you can actually gain additional customer insight into your data using Melissa's analytics. Now, easily build address verification and customer data validation into your customer app, custom application using Melissa's APIs. Now, they actually have CRM cloud connectors as well and an e-commerce plugins, or you can upload your customer files for just quick data cleanse. Now, Melissa is serious about securing and securely managing your data. They continually undergo independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. They are SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. And in fact, mailers spend about $20 billion annually in undeliverable mail. Don't lose customers or cash. Make every address count. Bad data happens to good companies. That's why 10,000 organizations worldwide trust Melissa to get their customer data clean and accurate. Get started today with 25,000 records cleaned for free. That's a $75 value at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit or call 1-800-MELISSA to find out more. And we thank Melissa for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We get to actually bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And today we have Shauna Wolverton, Senior Vice President of Product over there at Zendesk. Shauna, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, you know, our we have some fantastic topics to talk about today, but our audience loves, loves, loves to hear about origin stories. Can you maybe take the folks at home on a journey through tech and how you ended up at Zendesk? It is a... Uh quite a journey. So like strap in. Um, <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> like everyone, right, fell in love with Russian literature in college, uh, which prepared me for very, very little, it turned out, <clears throat> after I graduated. Uh, but I was uh, lucky enough to have a, a cousin who, uh, who had a job. She was working at Autodesk doing localization. And I had not heard of localization before. Um, and for your guests, uh, and listeners who don't know, it's you know the process of translating software and adapting for for other languages and cultures. And um, she stuck me in a printer closet and uh, gave me a bright, shiny new NT Windows box, state of the art, and uh, and had me resizing uh, you know strings and resource boxes um, for for days on end. And I, I got my hands like dirty. I was running a build and I was playing with software and I was like, oh, this, this actually is great uh, and awesome. But um, so from there went on, um, you know, it was a, we were done. We shipped it. We, we burned the CDs and put them in a box and shipped them, which is a thing we used to do. Um, <laughs> and, um, and from there kind of started and did some more localization work for a translation agency and the good news was it was the late 90s uh, in San Francisco and um, the Don Kama Palooza was happening. And I sort of took all of these things I'd learned and started 
um, working for companies who were just starting to figure out their websites. I'd sort of gotten my hands dirty in tech, taught myself some things along the way, and sort of ended up in this marketing communications, helping people move all of their desktop publishing stuff that they were printing uh, onto the web, which was really great. And one of those early websites I built turned into a product, and they made me the product manager. It's like, oh, oh, this job. This is amazing, right? It, it, there's no like, uh, I want to be a product manager, Barbie, uh, when you're a kid. So I, <laughs> right, it was right. another thing I didn't really uh, know about. So I sort of got my hands dirty in this product management job. It was awesome. I was having such a great time. And then the bust happened. And um, I spent a bunch of time trying to find product management jobs, but Um, I was clearly not nearly as qualified as a whole bunch of people out in the world. And I had a friend who uh, had gone to work at Salesforce and he called me and said, did you, do you want it? We have a localization job. It's like, no, no, don't, don't make me. Um, It has, you know, like this uh, incredible uh, escape velocity localization. I think a lot of people think it's a dark art. If you uh, know how to do it, it's really hard to not be asked to do it over and over again. Languages tend to scare people. But um, my husband actually has always been in sales and marketing. And he said, oh, uh, Parker Harris, co-founder of Salesforce, uh, gave me a demo of uh, Salesforce. It's super cool. You should go work there. So, um, you know, I took a big step back in my career, um, but knew uh, sort of I was getting, had a sense I was getting on a rocket ship. So pretty quickly from there, um, I actually started doing the product management job. Uh, they wouldn't give me an official job, but I was uh, fixing bugs and reproducing cases and uh, walking around to developers, asking them to, to check in the code fixes for me. So um, they're like, fine, Shauna, please stop harassing our developers and we'll give you a team. So uh, they gave me a little corner of the world. I was the internationalization product manager. And after a little bit of doing that, they realized, oh, wait, you told us you'd done this before. Uh, and I started at the very bottom of the stack. I was doing schema um, and and then I moved up and I got excited. I was doing logic and orchestration and sort of that middle tier. And then I, I finished my career at Salesforce um, leading the lightning effort of sort of rebuilding the entire UI stack and then the, the kind of design uh, and rollout of that new UI. So if you are a Salesforce user and you use lightning, uh, I'm sorry, but it's getting much better. <laughs> Got it. So, you know, it's an interesting fact. Um, I actually came from the Dynamic CRM group, so it's definitely uh, a space that's near and dear to my heart. So I, I love the industry. But you know, I can tell you Zendesk has had a really huge presence in the market, especially in the help desk market for years. Can you maybe tell us a little about how Zendesk has been evolving over the years? Sure. You know, I mean, uh, one of the things that makes Zendesk Zendesk is that we're not we're not from around here. We've we've started in Denmark. Um, three guys who were really appalled at, at what was available to small businesses um, if they wanted to do support. And um, we had this sort of global beginning in in Copenhagen uh, until the team moved uh, stateside. And that early focus was really about you know ease and um, beautiful simplicity and really making. It's super easy for anyone to, you know, swipe a credit card and go. Um, you know, the getting started experience was super fast. Time to value was crazy short. And um, it's still a huge part of who we are. But over time, as we've matured the product, have we've sort of moved beyond just a support ticketing, help desk, uh, chat and talk channels, and now uh, a new product for um, salespeople as well as uh, a platform we're really um, kind of looking at a big kind of time of maturation for Zendesk. And I think the great thing is um, we're finding that a lot of what we've built doesn't just help kind of our SMB customers, but in that great way that SaaS democratizes all things, we're finding um, that, you know, our one product can help uh, customers across our segments. Right, right. Now, a lot of, we're a lot of hearing actually that Zendesk believes in the future growth is tied to becoming a platform and adding new applications. In fact, like you said, you guys just announced that new suite of support and sales. Now, how is becoming a platform transforming the business for you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, 
when uh, when you're starting out and you're building applications, um, there's a lot of problems you can solve for customers. But what having a platform allows is that you know you can say yes. You can say to a, yes to a lot more things. So when customers show up, we don't have to build the you know the the we don't have to go to the bottom of the well of feature requests. We can really build the tools um, that enable our partners uh, to participate in our platform ecosystem and allows our customers to you know build out exactly what they need uh, on a platform that's open right it's uh, built kind of in and of AWS so it's really easy for developers to use the tools they want to use and to start getting going really quickly right now that I want to get into that a little bit more because I've experienced like I said dynamic CRM client platform in the past and providing APIs and ways to customize the, the platform is super pow- powerful for organizations to help kind of make the workflow their own. But Zendesk is taking us a, a step further there where they're actually open sourcing things and open API things. Can you maybe take us through that and how it's really kind of transforming things for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I think traditionally with platforms, we see a lot that, um, you know, data sort of lives in disparate places. Um, a lot of times it's locked. You know, you think about some of these old... Um, systems you come across that, you know, are still on premise, don't have APIs, or if they do, um, you know, some of the cloud vendors with APIs that there's a lot of lock-in and and proprietary kind of ness of all of those things. So with the Sunshine platform, we're really thinking about how you bring all of your customer data together and make that available both to uh, extend our portfolio of applications to make it great for agents to have everything they need to know about who a customer is, the things they've been doing, um, and sort of all of the data that supports that and and really help agents, but also to use that data to personalize the kinds of experiences that your customers have, um, kind of everywhere they're interacting with you. Well, folks, we are talking with uh, Shauna Wolverton, Senior Vice President of Product Zendesk, and we're talking a little about how CRM is really transforming organizations. But before we get back to all of that goodness, we have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's, of course, PlexTrack. Now, when it comes to security assessments, I think we all agree on one thing. Reporting just stinks. Now, PlexTrack's founder, Dan DeClos, he's a 15-year veteran of cybersecurity, and he's actually holds both a CISSP and an OSP license. And what he found was with you spending most of his time on application penetration testing was that it actually is not easy to do. So Dan actually decided to build his own solution called PlexTrack. Now, PlexTrack has since raised venture capital, employs over a dozen people, and boasts Fortune 500 companies as clients. Now, what can PlexTrack actually do for you and your organization? Well, PlexTrack is the purple training or teaming platform that provides rapid reporting for red teams as well as tracking, remediation, and attestation for blue teams. Now, it brings those two security teams together without the need to actually physically sit together. Now, there are, through central interface, PlexTrack actually gives red teams the ability to report issues and blue teams are able to remediate them. Now, red teams can actually import their findings from numerous scanners. They can include screenshots and videos with auto formatting. They can also customize Word and PDF exports with their current templates. And they can actually streamline reviews with intuitive web-based readouts. Now, the blue team has some even additional functionality as well. They can actually customize internal and external assessment questionnaires. And they also can synchronize findings with task management tools like integrations with Jira Cloud. Now, they can also assign findings to different team members and track status over time. In fact, They can provide attestation of security posture with, in fact, really robust analytics, too. Now, PlexTrack improves the entire security engagement lifecycle by making it easy to actually generate security reports, deliver them securely, and track the issues to completion straight from the platform. PlexTrack is the solution for enabling the purple teaming process and can be launched in just 10 minutes. That's right, 10 minutes. Try PlexTrack free for one month, either on-prem or in the cloud with no contracts or risks. Simply go to PlexTrack.com slash twit to claim your free month. That's PlexTrack.com slash twit. And we thank PlexTrack for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Folks, we're talking with Shauna Wolverton, Senior Vice President of Product at Zendesk. So, Shauna, you talked a little bit about 
how you kind of moved towards uh, providing open platforms and open APIs and how it's really kind of transforming organizations so they can kind of customize things. Now, we heard a little bit about um, something interesting in the in the market recently, something about conversational business and how there's kind of a developer first base API for conversations. Can you maybe take us through what that is and how it's helping organizations? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the sort of future of, I mean, Right now, people want to have natural conversations. No one wants to call a business and sort of repeat, go through an IVR, repeat who they are, tell them who they are. It, we we do this benchmark study, and we found that an overwhelming number of millennials say that the first place they go to get answers to a question they have uh, with a business is their phone. I think it's funny. I don't think they actually know that the phone is a phone. I think they... They don't know that you can call people, but yes, so they they want self-service and if they can't get self-service, they want to get the answer fast. And usually the fastest way to do that and the way we are all comfortable doing that today is you text or you WhatsApp. And what we're doing is enabling that for the enterprise. So we have this idea of a conversations API. So you imagine you know everything about uh, who your customers are, the things that they're doing. And now we're bringing in this idea of all of the conversations that you've had. So a really deep data store over time that allows you to sort of understand your history with every one of your customers um, and then pick that up. No matter who picks up the the, the interaction, you can kind of take uh, take that conversation right from where you left off. Fantastic. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in because they're chomping at the bit here behind the scenes. Uh, I want to go to you, Curtis. Um, Chris, what kind of things have you experienced here from the enterprise perspective from CRM? I've been doing this long enough to remember early CRM products like Goldmine that were you know, pretty much straightforward CRM applications. What we've seen, and especially in the case of Salesforce, is the evolution of CRM from product to platform, you know, where do you see that? And and how do you treat that evolution as you are looking at Zendesk from a product management perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I lived through uh, the move from our Rolodexes to uh, Goldmine and ACT. And I think, you know, CRM went, of course, much, much bigger. And I think sometimes somewhere in there, we sort of lost the C. And, um, you know, we might need to sort of go back to some of those times about like fundamentally this is about knowing the people and the humans. And I think what's really interesting to me and one of the reasons I joined Zendesk is this idea of coming to CRM from a service first point of view, right? Um, there are some CRMs pe that come in from IT and they're talking to the CIO about ITSM stuff. And there's some uh, CRM that comes in from from a sales Thing, and it's about, you know, extraction and transactional things. And we're really thinking about the entire CRM market, um, both across selling and servicing sort of every point you are in the customer journey is like, how can we infuse helpfulness and sort of think about um, CRM from that angle, um, which I think is a little bit different than uh, how uh, some of the other parts of the market see CRM. a quick question here if someone is in fact looking for customer relationship management you know something that will help them you know track the activity during sales calls and keep up with all of the data that you need to keep up with when you're getting ready to make sales calls does Zendesk do that I mean have have we in fact left customer relationships behind in the effort to have the CRM platform be the be all and end all for everyone in the sales organization. Yeah, I mean, I think the need to sort of understand your customers and the deals you're doing with them won't ever go away. Um, and Zendesk, you know, traditionally has this brand that's very, very tied to service, but now we do have a sell product um, that there's a great sort of uh, SMB, uh, SFA tool that allows reps to, um, you know, going back to that sort of conversational future that we're all sort of betting on here. It's really a look at and a sort of 
conversational look at SFA. Of course, we're tracking opportunities and leads and conversion, um, but we're making sure you have the channels that you need to really engage in conversations um, with your customers and to track those conversations in a way um, that helps you close more deals. Shauna, we've been talking about you know different types of things and getting started. You, you talked about sunshine. You talked about how millennials are moving the industry towards more self-help. So I guess the question is, if I'm an SMB and I'm g trying to spin things up, in fact, I was an SMB trying to spin up a um, help desk, but I wanted the help desk, um, the CRM product, to also help me build a knowledge base. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things do I need to consider? What kinds of things do I need to do as far as homework before I start calling someone, say, at Zendesk saying, help, help, help? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, knowledge bases clearly are the foundation of a uh, self-service experience for your customers, but they are sort of only as good as the effort that you put into them. Um, I think sometimes, uh, you know, the biggest pitfall here is that people sort of shortchange the effort that it takes to write really good content that's really useful and allows people to um, to get some of those answers. And then, the great thing about making that investment is it pays tremendous dividends. Once you have a really robust uh, knowledge base, you um, can start leveraging that for a lot of um, AI and ML. So, um, you know, putting a bot there that can really help people find answers even more quickly than sort of search alone. Um, you know, the ability to bring bots into that conversation so that, you know, we're, they can not only sort of have a conversation and get people uh, answers from a from a knowledge base, but maybe even you know actually kind of solve a problem. We we see this like in airlines through our bot technology, the ability to actually um, you know push a, a seat map so you can change the seat real in real time. So and this all sort of starts with this idea of self service and this idea of really focusing on helping people get answers uh, as quickly as possible without having to, um, you know, to bother your agents um, with some of the more trivial things, password resets, um, you know, how do I fix this? You turn it off and you turn it back on again. That's almost always the answer. But um, yeah, I think uh, investing in a, in a knowledge base can is great, but does take um, people who really think about it and focus on it and, and give it the care and attention that it needs. Super cool. So, Shauna. Our listeners are all around the world and they want to know where can they go to go get started. Is there a demo program with Zendesk? Um, how do they get more information from you? Yeah, absolutely. So Zendesk.com, click on the free trial button at the top. Oh, look at that. Get started. Ah, get started. I should know that. Um, or free trial, right? Either way, all of it. We've got demos. We allow you to kind of uh, click right in and in just minutes, uh, you can start using the product. Um, all of the features uh, that you could need are there. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you want to keep going, it's as easy as swiping a credit card and being on your way. If you need a little extra help, we're available too. You can give us a call. We'd gladly uh, give you a, a, a more tailored demo or, or talk you through any issues you have. But, um, you know, if you're a small business and you want to get started, we're ready. And if our, your listeners are all over the world, so are we. Um, I actually have a product development organization that spans 10 countries. Super exciting. Um, and uh, we're in over 60 languages mm -hmm. on Zendesk. So um, whatever language you speak, we can uh, we can help you out. Fantastic. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best day enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10 PC virus scans. But I want to thank everyone who makes the show possible, especially to my co-hosts, especially those guys, starting with our very own Mr. Ge the, the Geek in Paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you in the coming weeks, and where can people get in touch with you to talk a little bit of Twyat? On Twitter, I am A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. And I'm also Chebert at twit.tv. But better yet, why don't you use Twiet at twit.tv and throw those show ideas at us. You know, we've had some great show ideas. Keep them coming. I want to work on them. I want to try and book guests to go and talk about them. Uh, we've got a lot of 
great guests coming up and you know i'm looking forward to seeing them on the show anyway after this i need to go down to pier 35 and help drop an ob underwater observatory in the water fantastic sounds exciting well we also have to thank our very own mr curtis franklin people love reading your stuff curtis where can they folks go to find you and all of your work well, as always, you can find my work at Dark Reading and especially The Edge of Dark Reading. I've got a couple of pieces coming up this coming week on risk, putting numbers to the risk in cybersecurity and figuring out what the risk of third parties are to your cybersecurity environment. So lots of good stuff coming up there as well as a couple of good interviews. You can follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA, and please let me know if there's someone or something you'd like to see an article on. I appreciate all the help I get from the viewers of Twiat. Well, I definitely appreciate you guys being here. Thank you guys both for being here. Well, folks, we also want to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and to listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it actually easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go out right now to our show page, twit.tv slash twiet. There you will find all of the amazing back episodes, plus all the show notes, co-host information, and the guest information. Plus, more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links as well. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version, or your HD video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or on any one of your podcast applications as well. It's really the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. Now, after you subscribe, you can also impress your family and friends and your coworkers by sharing Twiat with them as well. So, in fact, if you're going to subscribe, you should also, and you're available at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on Fridays, we actually do this show live. That's right, live.twit.tv. Come see how the shows run. Come see all the behind the scenes, the banter, the fun we have here at Twit. Come see and watch at Twit, actually live.twit.tv. Now, if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump in to the chat room live as well. We have a great chat room, great set of characters up there uh, and out there at irc.twit.tv. Just go ahead and navigate in your browser, irc.twit.tv. We love the chat room. We have some great discussions during the show. So if you're gonna watch the show live, come in there and jump into the show to the chat room as well, live as well. Now, if you can't watch the show live and you still wanna be part of the conversation as well, we have an amazing community out there, 24 seven community. The discussion continues to go on and on at Twit. Dot community. That's right, www.twit.community. We have a great set of people out there. The Twit Army's out there. Our, 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 our discussions on content and hosts and guests and all different types of things are going on out there. So go check it out. Come join the community at twit.community. Now, remember, you can always follow me at twitter.com slash luemm. That's right. There I post all my enterprise tidbits. Of course, great conversations with people like you. Plus, I also post what I'm doing at my normal daily work week at Microsoft. There you can also check out dev.office.com. We post all the latest and greatest ways for you to customize your office experience and make it work better for your organization. I also want to thank everyone who makes the show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week at Enterprise Tech each and every week, and we couldn't do the show without them. We couldn't do the show without the engineers at Twit as well, so I want to thank them as well. We also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. Thank you, Chibert, for doing all the work of the bookings and the plannings and the shows. Uh, we couldn't do the show without you, so thank you so much, sir. Before we sign out, though, we do have to thank our TD for today, Jeff. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know that things are kind of going crazy everywhere, and we appreciate you being here and being part of the show. But we do have to continue our tradition of asking what what is the major topic of, of the show today? Avoid the coronavirus. And if your company can support you to work at home, that's a great thing. And also, there's going to be a lot of new technology to figure out how to make this go better in the future. And keep it secure. You know what? You got a lot of you got a lot of the essence there. I would say you got a lot of the essence. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. But I would say it was much closer to remote working isn't all that and it has some unintended consequences. But maybe next time. Thanks for Jeff for playing. And until next time, I'm Luis Moresca, just reminding you. If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just 
keep quiet.